sorry. So um, I'm going to talk about persecution, and it might be a little basic for, for some people in the room, but I hope to um, give a few examples that are from outside of the US and to kind of offer a little bit of a comparative approach. Although a lot of what I'm talking about um, applies in the EU, where I do most of my work, as well as in the United States. Um, and um, I'll start with an introduction to some of the basic uh, legal instruments, which we're probably all familiar with, but just to go through and particularly look at persecution and how it's defined. Um, then I'll talk about kind of generally what persecution uh, means in different countries. Um, again, I'll probably be using uh, the UK and the US as my guideposts. And then I'll talk about persecution in the context of LGBTI claims and go through a couple of um, a couple of the issues that actually Neil mentioned uh, in his talk and maybe build on them and talk about what usually qualifies as persecution and what doesn't usually qualify as persecution uh, in those areas of, um, of, of abuse. Then I'll talk about persecution in context, um, uh, kind of looking at one particular trend that's been uh, talked about both here and specifically in the UK in, in the last year after a big judgment in the UK came down, um, eliminating the discretion test for LG, LGB uh, applicants. It didn't really mention trans or intersex people, but, um, but it can be extrapolated to gender variant um, claimants. Uh, I'll talk about the pushback from, from I guess, immigration uh, policy officials um, on after that judgment. So the judgment was seen as a big victory, but there are a lot of other problems that the judgment has, has created um, for claimants. And then I'll um, show a few resources at the, at the very end, which are just websites that I tend to turn to for a lot of my research um, on the issue. So I'm sure we're all familiar with, um, with the Geneva Convention, but uh, for those of you who might not be, the 1951 Geneva Convention on the status of, um, of refugees and the 1967 Protocol, which opened up the, the idea of the refugee um, to anyone fitting a certain description, not just uh, people who were fitting that description and claim persecution um, from events that happened during the Second World War. Um, though that, that document has basically become the document that national governments and regional bodies um, look to for guidance. I mean, uh, countries sign on to the Geneva Convention, but also have to interpret its rules and interpret what it means by persecution. Persecution isn't really defined in the Geneva Convention at all, so it's really up to countries to create some sort of international consensus, some best practice, and even that, obviously, because there is no such thing as a real consensus on, on these issues. It varies from country to country what persecution actually means. So the convention is kind of the guidepost. Uh, the 2008 UNHCR guidance note on refugee claims relating to sexual orientation and gender identity has been really instructive for, um, for countries, uh, particularly in the EU, to harmonize their ideas of what, um, of what persecution means, what it means to qualify as a refugee uh, under certain um, circumstances that were very variant in the EU, just for example, just because I know that um, the, the debates in the EU best. Uh, there was a lot of discussion before the, the, uh, the guidance note came out on whether or not um, a state actor uh, had to be the actor primarily responsible for, for the persecution. Obviously now we, we know that there's lots of jurisprudence of non-state actors causing persecution, um, but there's a lot of variance as to how much the state had to tolerate a non-state actor persecuting an individual before allowing the non-state actor to be the reason for persecution and allowing the refugee claim on that basis. So France was a country that was particularly vehement about um, preferencing claims coming from state actor rather than a non-state actor. And after the guidance note came out, um, there was a great deal of harmonization on that issue so that um, non-state actors were also given kind of, you know, full weight was given to claims made on the basis of persecution by a non-state actor. So gangs, family members, paramilitaries, that sort of stuff. So it was a very important uh, guidance note. Also for, persecu for persecution as a, uh, a, a concept, it kind of got countries talking and got them on the same page about it uh, in, in, in Europe at least. And then you have national implementation. Um, so 
for example, our basic immigration laws, you know, the Immigration and Nationality Act, the Refugee Act, in the UK, the National Immigration and Asylum Act, um, are all responsible for bringing the Geneva Convention basically into national legislation, implementing the treaty. At the bottom, I put humanitarian protection, because outside of the scope of actually applying for refugee protection, there are other ways of getting leave to remain uh, in certain countries that you're applying for, for asylum in. And leave for, to remain doesn't mean you have refugee status, and it doesn't necessarily mean you are claiming persecution based on a Geneva Convention reason, which I'll get to the next slide. But it means that you can't be sent back to your country of origin because you'll be tortured or, or treated with severe, um, you know, severe violation of human rights. Uh, so on, on the international level, we have the Convention Against Torture, which the United States is obviously a party to, and which is responsible for lots of people being able to stay in the U.S. regardless of whether or not they, or you know, in spite of them being um, rejected as uh, an applicant for asylum. So quickly, we've, we've gone through this uh, earlier, but the Geneva Convention defines a refugee as someone owing to the well-founded fear of being persecuted by reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership, or a particular social group, which is the, the category that that most concerns LGBTI applicants, um, or political opinion. Political opinion has also been used um, in some claims, though, though many times not successfully, based on the fact that LGBT people, if they identify themselves as activists or are, are somehow um, recognizably affiliated with a certain political leaning um, on the basis of being uh, an LGBT person, can use that as part of their claim for <coughs> asylum. Having to go through, through that process of, of you know, um, of completing that extra step and saying, oh, it's because of political opinion, can sometimes be more difficult than just the, the PSG um, uh, idea. But it, it, it's another type of claim that LGBT people, um, LGBTI people have been able to use um, to get asylum. And then the rest, the rest we've done that. I won't spend time going through just that definition. There are a couple of other structures that, uh, that coordinate um, uh, the idea of asylum and particularly persecution. So we have the EU directives, uh, which are binding um, instruments, although they're implemented by the states. So the directives are not binding in their, they're not directly applicable in the member states. They have to be put into national legislation. Um, but we have the reception conditions directive, which basically outlines settlement and, and ideas about um, what the, what people who are applying for asylum are entitled to during their uh, during their process, the qualifications directive, which outlines what a refugee is, um, and discusses persecution in some in some way, uh, and the asylum procedures uh, directive. All of those are binding in EU countries and have done a lot to harmonize um, jurisprudence on um, on uh, asylum uh, asylum applicants. The EU regulation. And regulations in the EU are directly applicable in their in their textual articulation from the EU on states. Uh, the Dublin Declaration was in 2003, and you'll notice that preceded all of these directives, and there's a good reason for that. Um, harmonization in the EU was partly prompted by the fact that the Dublin Declaration made it difficult for people to pass through, uh, asylum applicants to pass through one state and go to another state and apply in the state that they landed. So as I mentioned, France was very, uh, was very opposed to a broader version of um, the state actor idea for, for persecution. So France was rejecting a lot of claims from people who were abused by non-state actors. Um, so people knew that they had a better chance of you know, getting asylum in the UK. So that was one of the ways that that the EU decided to push back on the idea of forum shopping by passing the Dublin Declaration, which made it you know, illegal to, or made it impossible for people to claim asylum in a second country once they've gone through one EU country. And we also know from the US that we have the safe country concept. So there are certain countries that if you pass through that country, you have to have applied for asylum in that country before applying in, in the US. And the EU has not only the EU Dublin rules, but also other safe countries that, um, that are on that list. So these are hurdles for asylum, asylum applicants. The directives um, helped at least to level the playing field a little bit 
you know, um, on the more liberal side of interpreting uh, refugees and persecution a little more broadly. So there was some give and take, but the Dublin Declaration is very, very difficult, and it's, it's a big hurdle for, for uh, refugees in the EU. Then we have national implementing um, measures. The humanitarian protection in the EU case also includes um, the European Convention on Human Rights, which uh, in Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights is the right not to be tortured or um, treated inhumanely. That really comes up a lot. I mean, it comes up sort of like the Convention Against Torture will come up in the United States for the purposes of humanitarian leave to remain. Um, outside of refugee protection in, in uh, the EU. And the starting principle that is basically the principle of non refoulement um, I always say that wrong, non refoulement that is non uh, <laughs> in non uh, refoulement in the European context. And that's just a court decision that reiterates the, the principle of, of Article 3 in the European Convention of Human Rights. So, um, I won't go through this whole thing, but this is the definition of persecution in the qualification directive in the EU, which includes um, sufficiently serious nature of uh, the violation of its uh, human right, um, let's see, sexual violence, legal, administrative, police, or judicial measures, which are themselves, in, themselves discriminatory. Um, obviously, these are really extrapolated to, or, or what you can't get from this definition is the, the degree to which uh, the violence needs to happen, the severity. And that comes out in, in the jurisprudence. So this is a very general definition, but I won't go through it because it's, it's really context specific and the bar is quite high. Um, but it, it resembles a lot of what we've been talking about in terms of the types of, of persecution that people um, can claim asylum for. So in general, persecution isn't really defined in the Geneva Convention. Um, the definition has been seen as vague, quite flexible, and subjective. It's been quite open, especially in the EU, even after these harmonization um, uh, measures have come in. Immigration equality has been one, one organization that I've, I've noticed really tries to map out um, what the different types of persecution can look like and what we have to be aware of when making claims um, in terms of the severity to which that persecution needs to be proven in order to get the claim approved. And the, the areas that they, they've outlined, <clears throat> and I've, I've changed them a bit um, for, for my presentation, uh, are serious physical harm, um, coercive or medical, uh, sorry, coercive medical or psychological treatment, invidious pr uh, prosecution or disproportionate punishment for criminal offenses. And that has to be really, really High. The burden is quite high. As Neil mentioned, it's not enough that uh, a country outlaws um, same-sex sexual activity. The country has to actually enforce it and has to go significant step in making the person aware that there is going to be persecution in the future. Severe discrimination and economic persecution, that's an understatement as well. It needs to be quite severe and quite um, explicit and directed toward the individual. And the same with severe criminal extortion or robbery. So what I'll, go, what, what I'll do is go through those areas and kind of look at certain differences in what would probably likely be, be classified as persecution in that area and what might not. Um, it's quite dangerous to do this, actually, because it's a case-by-case -case decision, and obviously these broad definitions are contingent upon lots of things. But in general, if someone were to have a basic discussion about persecution like this, it'd be good to at least have a, a, a vague idea of, of what some of the differences are in these types of claims. So, serious physical harm. Um, some of the main ones, rape, sexual assault, and other forms of gender and sexuality-based violence, um, including, uh, including against people who have an imputed gay identity. There was a good article by Joe, Joe Landau in the Fordham Law Review a few years ago about imputed um, gay identity and, what was it, and, uh, and soft immutability. And immutability is this idea that you can't change something, and that's what makes you part of a particular social group. And he looks at um, actually the Ninth Circuit and how the Ninth Circuit has decided on some of these issues um, and put people with imputed identity uh, in, in the category of a um, particular social group, which has been very helpful. But those types of violence are, are kind of characteristic of the type of violence, um, the level of violence that, that has to be shown um, for persecution. 
threats that cause psychological harm, and that's and that also sounds very vague, but um, threats alone that don't cause any um, any recognizable harm, which I put on the on the right column, um, aren't part of what constitutes persecution. They can go to corroborate some sort of claim, but alone it's not enough to um, to say that I was threatened, um, and that's that's part of my persecution. Jumping back to the left column, the, the, the third thing is threats by a group that, that had the will and the ability to carry out promises of violence. So uh, a, a more in-depth claim of future persecution, including some sort of argument and, and a credible argument um, and probably corroborative evidence that the group that made the threat has the ability and the intention to carry out the threat. Um, that's when it, it, it probably will go toward a persecution um, argument that will be more likely successful than just a threat alone, which will not. And then violence against the applicant's family has also been um, has also been the grounds for proving persecution uh, for the claimant. And the last thing on the on the right side is isolated instances of violence in a context that supports protection against the violence. So if you're in a situation where um, you were beaten up uh, and called derogatory terms, it's not enough just to prove that that is persecution. There has to be either some sort of past practice or there, have to be, there has to have been um, so, sort of the tolerance on the side of law enforcement. And these things all go to prove that it's something that can happen again and it's something that um, uh, either proves past, past practice or future persecution. Um, one isolated incident is usually not enough to, to prove it, even though there are other circumstances where it could be enough. So again, these are kind of vague outlines of some of the issues that come up with the physical harm um, claims for persecution uh, and disproportionate punishment. So some of the ideas that, that I had looking at um, some of the cases that I've seen are criminalization of same-sex sexual activity and a track record of enforcement. So if um, you know, if the death penalty is in the country, but it's never been, it's never been used, um, it's difficult to, to show a claim of persecution based on that because if it's not going to be used, then it doesn't actually show that a person knows that they're going to be persecuted in the future. Um, it sounds pretty harsh, but uh, for instance, one of the cases that we're dealing with now that I'll mention later in the UK is from a guy from Tanzania, and um, the, the criminalization there uh, includes a 14 or 18 year sentence um, hard labor and that sort of thing. And persecution, we didn't really get to the persecution issue in that case, which I'll explain as well. But, um, but the, 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 uh, the border agency just summarily dismissed it as something that was never going to uh, translate to persecution because it was never, um, it was never really used. It was, like people weren't actually put into hard labor and abused in these situations. Um, but a track re record of enforcement of some uh, punishment that's disproportionate and brutal, so a track record of, um, of, you know, of death, you know, the death penalty could potentially be treated um, uh, for proven persecution. Severe punishment linked to pretextual prosecution based on sexuality. Um, and that's something like, uh, you know, a very violent punishment um, for a crime that actually doesn't deserve it, but there's a pretext that you've been given that crime, uh, given that punishment because of your sexuality, would also be a way to try to, to go for, um, for persecution based on prosecution. On the other side, the mere existence of criminal laws prohibiting same sex sexual activity does not alone constitute persecution. The next is course of medical treatment. Um, this is also extremely case specific, and uh, medical treatment is something that uh, the LGBTI community faces a, on a regular basis, and it's difficult to, to parse out what counts as persecution or not. The Ninth Circuit has ruled that forcible institutionalization um, can count as persecution in certain cir circumstances, and in this case, um, uh, the, the woman applying for asylum was given forcible drug injections and um, I think electroshock therapy as well. So basically the whole left side of the whole left column. Um, and was awarded persecution, uh, um, sorry, was awarded uh, asylum on the basis of persecution by, uh, by the state. But other types of medical treatment um, might not raise the level of persecution. So 
adequate medical treatment, for instance, for HIV. In Europe, this was a big deal. Um, in the UK specifically, of, of about 10 years ago, where there was a case uh, where a woman was in uh, detention, uh, immigration detention. She'd been receiving some medicine while in the, in the UK for treatment for her, um, for her HIV. And the medicine basically made her body react in such a way that it became dependent on the medicine. And then they, the question was, can we send her um, back to Uganda? She's from Uganda. Uh, having put her in a position where her body is now dependent on, on her drug therapy. And in terms of persecution, the answer was no, because she couldn't prove that um, it wasn't persecution because they wouldn't see, they, the court did not see that as uh, an issue that fell under the state's uh, will for, willful or unwilling um, uh, non-protection of her to, by some non-state actor, in this case, uh, disease. Um, and the other question was whether they send her back because they know she's going to face um, you know, inhumane treatment under a different thing, under the European Convention on Human Rights. And the answer was also no, um, because they, they argued that she, was, she had a terminal disease and she would pass away anyway. So this is the, this is the, type, of, this is the type of discourse that, that the, the, um, the term is, is dealing with. And a lot of the pushback politically was, oh, OK, obviously, <laughs> it's very arbitrary what we call persecution and what we don't call persecution. Um, and it's just a matter of um, what the pol politics are like, um, because if we let one person in because she doesn't get uh, adequate medical treatment, we have to let everyone in. But the, the other side of that argument is that she was already in the country receiving medicine, and it's partly because of the UK that she was in that position. So it's a very, very difficult test. In the UK, I think the test is higher than, um, than it would be in the US, but there, yeah, I'm not sure. Another thing that I put is phallometric testing um, uh, or vaginal photophlesmography. And that's something that Neil wrote a report on, and it's basically the testing of um, the determination of sexual orientation. Um, and this was happening in the Czech Republic. So in the EU, uh, there was a question of whether or not the Czech Republic should be physically examining people to figure out whether they're um, gay or lesbian uh, by showing them, I think, showing them pornography and hooking them up to some device. And that's seen as violating uh, the European Convention of Human Rights. It's not seen as persecution in and of itself, although it's seen as humane, inhumane and, and uh, degrading treatment. Um, but that's the type of difference. So it, there'd be a different reason for these to remain there, which is why I put it in the right column, even though it seems clear that that's a human right. I'll, uh, go through very quickly economic persecution and uh, severe discrimination. Discrimination isn't alone. It's a reason for uh, or proof for persecution in the, in the asylum context. Um, but an inability to travel safely anywhere in the country um, is a type of discrimination that limits your life in such a way that it rises to the level of persecution. Forced expulsion from the country, obviously, um, is a type of persecution because behind that is the violence of perhaps death depending on how you can prove that, that rises to the level. Deliberate imposition of a substantial disadvantage, and that means um, you know, the inability to find any type of work at all, as opposed to on the right side of the column, lack of opportunities to practice your own profession. There have been cases where um, a person can't practice dentistry, but that doesn't mean that the person is able to prove persecution based on not being able to work. You just can't be a dentist, which is discrimination, but it doesn't rise to the level of persecution um, uh, the US case, um, but that wouldn't rise to the level of persecution. Back on the left side, being outcast from society as an HIV positive person it depends on the degree of being outcast, but there was a case um, that a person lost their job, was turned away from the hospital and forbidden to marry, uh, and that was enough to prove persecution that rose to a significant level. Um, rather than, um, oh wait, did I put that in the wrong phone? Recurring and overt discrimination that does not oh, does not seriously restrict the right to livelihood, practice religion, or access to education is not persecuted. So there's kind of the balance there. And then severe criminal extortion. Um, it also depends just on the extent of the extortion. Threatening to disclose, to disclose sexual orientation in a sufficiently hostile environment, and there you have the same test as you would 
for proving that you've been persecuted, um, or proving future persecution based on sexual orientation. If someone's threatening to out you in that circumstance, uh, then that could go toward your persecution claim. But just criminal extortion uh, alone without that extra risk, risk of violence would um, I won't go into a lot of details I only have a minute left, but um, persecution context, especially in the UK, has basically hit a crossroads where over the last 15 years, uh, a woman named Jenny Milbeck, she's a professor in Australia, has done a lot of research on credibility and uh, the fact that in Commonwealth countries, so uh, and, and common law countries actually, the US included, the UK, Australia, and Canada, it's been much harder over the last 15 years to prove um, your identity and belonging to a particular social group. So that's generally a particular social group. It's been even harder for people to prove that there are uh, the sexual orientation or uh, is the reason for persecution or that their gender nonconformity is the reason for persecution. So um, her work deals with the last 15, 20 years and in the last couple of years in the UK it's gotten even worse because, um, sorry, because there was a decision by the Supreme Court of HT and HJ which basically said that the discretion test for being discreet about your sexuality as um, as a way to maintain your ability to stay in your home country and your responsibility to do that, that was eliminated. So now, um, if a person, uh, well, it's, it's kind of more complicated than it sounds, but if a person is realistically um, thought to reasonably, reasonably want to and have the intention to remain discreet, then they can stay in their home country, but they don't have responsibility to remain dis discreet, which means the discretion test for asylum is gone in the UK. Um, which mirrors the, the guidance note, uh, I think the spirit of the guidance note from the UNHCR in 2008, and where I think the EU would like to, to go. Unfortunately, this has caused pushback from, um, from the asylum authorities uh, who have made it a lot more difficult to actually prove um, your sexuality. So there's a case of a guy from Tanzania who was rejected on the basis of cred credibility, his name is um, Eddie Cosmas, and some of the reasons he was rejected were he didn't, um, he didn't remember exactly when Pride was the year before, and he couldn't, um, he couldn't define a relationship in the way that they were looking for. So they asked him how many relationships he had, and he said two. And then they asked him how many one-night stands, and there was a guy he'd slept with more than once, and they said, well, isn't that a relationship, and aren't you, aren't you aware of who you're having a relationship with? And it was really turning it in, in a way that relied on those types of stereotypes, and I, I like what you said about the stereotypes, um, that you know that's not how people are trained. And it is, it is probably, um, you know, it's disparate in the UK. I think some of the, some of the uh, UK border agents um, are taking these decisions to heart and really thinking critically about it, but there are an awful lot who are, who are really just using these stereotypes about um, sexual behavior and uh, sexual orientation, the expectations of what people should be doing to invalidate people's narratives about their sexual orientation. So the result, as I put at the bottom, is credibility usually cuts people's claims off now um, before they even get to the persecution question. Uh, so the persecution question kind of gets summarily dealt with. And on top of it, uh, a lot of cases are getting fast-tracked. So people don't have time to really produce a narrative that's coherent enough or in the right frame for the immigration uh, officials. So that's the state of affairs in, um, in the UK at least, and um, be interesting to see what it's like in, in the US, because I'm not as familiar with the credibility shift in, in the US. So, and at the end I just put a few websites that I tend to turn to for some of this information. Obviously there's also Ref World and a bunch of others, but those are the ones that I've brought up.